My name's Andy Butler. I am coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation down south in uh, Melbourne. And I want to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to uh, the countries that you may be tuning in from this morning. Um, I really want to thank Kwagoma for inviting me to give a talk on uh, in response to the European masterpieces from the Metropolitan Museum of Art New York exhibition. Um, I just want to flag that I come to this talk and, and to this um, sort of this exhibition with no art history training, uh, nor any artistic or curatorial training. Um, and so I bring a perspective that is um, perhaps a little bit outside of the, um, the sort of canonized and, and institutionalized perspectives that, that often circulate around these exhibitions. I guess the, the perspective that I do bring is one informed by an embeddedness in uh, discussions that have um, sort of flourished, especially in the past five years or so around institutional change within museums. Um, for me, that was really driven by my own experience in 2015 and 2016 of working as a you know, casual front of house staff member at a major state museum at a time where everybody was talking about diversity and inclusion and coming to that weird realization at the point that I was the diversity. Uh, so I sort of approach these questions really thinking about the contradictions of museums and their founding missions and the way that they, in, especially in a contemporary sense, discuss themselves as being agents for social change and for equality and a fight for justice. And I think that the European Masterpieces exhibition is a really interesting way to unpack these questions because not only does it give an overview of 500 years of the development of European painting, it also really tells a story of the founding mission of a major art museum, uh, which really has had such a huge influence on other museums founded in the late 19th century that also share a similar founding mission and goal and framework for operating. Now, I was approached to give this talk um, to ask the question, who is missing from art history? Um, and obviously this is a question that has been asked for a really long time. Um, so this work is from 1989 by the Gorilla Girls. It's about the Met Museum. It's a very well-known work now held in the collection of the Tate that obviously gives us some pretty dire statistics about the representation of people in the collection of the Met. Um, now, I feel that this work has really continued on since the 80s and definitely found a revival in the 21st century. And there's a, a very strong cohort of artists that continue to ask these questions about representation, about the numbers, about who's missing, about who's in our collection. And while I think these are really important questions, I feel like alongside this counting of people of who's represented, we need to think adds deeply about the how and the why these institutions write a particular art history that continues to exclude many. Um, so in my mind, it's actually quite easy to answer the question who is missing uh, from art history because the reality is there's a lot of people missing from art history. Um, but hopefully in this talk, I'll be able to slowly sort of, uh, and in a relatively short and superficial way, uh, sort of, um, uncover and unpack and scratch away at some of those surface questions to try and, and reach somewhere deeper uh, to sort of think about the, the dynamics and the frameworks of power that still engulf our, our museums. Um, this has been a question that has really come to the fore in the past uh, half decade or so and beyond. Um, so what you're looking at here is a series of images uh, that stretch back to 2016 that are indicative of a series of protests run by different groups uh, that speak to the broader structures of power that museums are embedded in today. Um, possibly the, the most uh, well-known one um, is this one here in the top right corner that brought a lot of attention to these sorts of, these sorts of movements. You may have heard of it. Um, it was uh, a campaign run by Decolonize This Place at the Whitney 
uh, against one of their, the vice chairman of the board of trustees, Warren Canders. So this happened at a time in 2018 where there was a lot of, you know, issues and anti-migrant um, rhetoric in the States and a lot of action on the US-Mexico border. So what was happening is the US border forces uh, were uh, sort of keep trying to um, turn back um, migrants, refugees, asylum seekers from the US-Mexico border by force using tear gas and smoke grenades. Now it came to the attention of the art world through hyperallergic that um, the tear gas and the smoke grenades were supplied by a corporation owned by the vice president of the Whitney named Warren Candace. Now, because of that, there was a, an open letter published by the staff at the Whitney who really felt that the public mission that the Whitney had committed itself to, to think deeply about uh, social justice and equality and to work with diverse artists was really out of step with working with someone like Warren Candace, who profited it off inequality and uh, the campaign against um, migration and asylum seekers in the US. I guess what's really interesting as well is that in this public letter, they also really pointed to the contradictions in the Whitney where most of the front of house staff and the casual staff and the precarious sort of employees were from backgrounds, cultural backgrounds that were directly affected by the um, anti-immigrant stance in the States that was in some way held up and propagated and supported by the, tri uh, by the vice chairman of the, of the uh, board of the Whitney. Um, so that, that uh, is that um, sort of protest that happened there. Uh, other images sort of speak to other protests that have happened Back to 2016, you'll see the ultra luxury art and ultra low wages um, projection on the Guggenheim there. That was to speak to the ways that Guggenheim Abu Dhabi was using contract workers uh, hired by the Emirates government uh, who were reportedly paid um, poverty wages, were forced to pay um, fees to be employed, their passports were taken away from them, sort of working in incredibly dire conditions. Um, there's another um, image here that speaks to the um, recent protests at the Tate around the cuts, uh, the job cuts following the COVID pandemic. Uh, it was feared that most of those job cuts would um, affect the lower paid, more precarious workers who for the most part are people of color. Uh, and you'll see on the top left there, there is a, um, a campaign in front of the Met that happened, I think last year. Um, there is a history of these sorts of campaigns against the contradictions of the relationships between museums and broader structures of power that's happened here in Australia as well. Um, so these are questions that have really bubbled to the surface since about 2014. You may recall the 2014 Biennale of Sydney that was boycotted by several artists um, over their relationship with Transfield, who at the time uh, were providing um, services to offshore detention centres. Um, and above that image there, there are two images from uh, protests that were held at the NGB about 2017 by people, uh, sort of really led by people who were associated with the Biennale of Sydney boycott, um, who really tried to draw attention to the relationship between uh, the NGB and Wilson Security. And at the time, Wilson Security was providing services to offshore, um, offshore detention centres. I speak to those sort of really thorny um, political movements that have happened around museums because last year was a really strange time for the ways that museums talked about their relationship to broader issues of justice and equality. Um, so there was this period in June or July last year that coincided with the Black Lives Matter movement where for many who had worked in museums for a long time, it felt like we existed in a bizarro world. Um, 
all of these institutions that had consistently been hostile to these discussions and protests about the links of museums to broader structures of inequality and power, all of a sudden were en masse releasing these um, statements about their commitment to anti-racism, about their commitment to being agents of change um, and justice. Uh, and so you'll see here there is a um, there is a statement from the Guggenheim, from the Tate, and uh, uh, and from the Met. Um, and this was, you know, this is indicative of a much broader process that happened around the world. Interesting, not very much in Australia, where as we faced the one of the largest um, civil rights movements of our generation the uh, museums and these centers of culture and cultural memory made the decision to take a stance and proclaim their support for these movements. What I really wanna do with this, this talk that I'll be giving that relates to the European Masters exhibition is to think really deeply about whether museums can meaningfully be agents for social change and justice in this period where we are going through huge political and social upheaval in the world with obviously with COVID, with the Black Lives Matter movement, with the after effects of the deep inequality that has um, sort of cemented itself following the 2008, uh, 2008 Great Recession. These museums and these cultural institutions that do play an incredibly important role in sort of shaping the public discourse and shaping our central art history and our canon have found themselves at a point where they realize they need to change. Um, and so I think thinking about the European Masters exhibition within this context will give us some really interesting clues as to the founding mission, founding vision, and founding dynamics of power behind these museums, and whether you know, 100 or 150 years on, we can really make claims to these museums making any significant um, internal change or reform. Um, so I, I really want to start with talking about this Francois um, Boucher painting, which I think is such a beautiful painting um, in the European Masterpieces exhibition. I'm really drawn to it because of the um, the tension between both the um, image of the subject here, uh, which is Venus, the Roman goddess of love, which was an incredibly uh, popular sort of um, subject for paintings at the time, you know, in the sort of tail end of the Renaissance and this, this desire and this want to return to antiquity and understand um, all of these, this mythology of the Romans and the Greeks, uh, which became a very, uh, you know, sort of popular subject matter for the bourgeoisie. Um, I think what makes this a really interesting rendering of Venus is that she sits within an incredibly opulent background that's actually more reminiscent of uh, the 18th century aristocracy. And that kind of makes sense for this painting because this painting by Boucher was commissioned by, um, uh, by Madame, oh, sorry, I just need to bring up my notes. Uh, so this uh, painting was commissioned by Madame de Pompadour, who was the main um, uh, mistress of King Louis at the time. Um, she was an incredibly big patron of Boucher and um, commissioned quite a few paintings. Now this image was originally commissioned for a private residence on the River Seine, a chateau owned by um, Madame de Pompadour. Uh, and so I just really wanna sort of encourage you to imagine this painting sitting within a private residence of a woman who is an official mistress of the royalty, who's wanting to align herself with these uh, high ideals of the European Renaissance, but bringing it within the own op with uh, the opulent interiors of the sort of buildings that she would sort of live in and inhabit. Um, I think this is an interesting painting as well to think about in relation to 
uh, New York in the late 19th century and the founding of the Met Museum. So as many of you may or may, not, may or may not know, in the late 19th century in New York, in the period of the founding of the museum, there was um, a period called the Gilded Age. Now, this was an age founded on incredible economic inequality and prosperity. Uh, so the, if you imagine all the Fifth Avenue mansions uh, in, in New York in the late 19th century, this is really that period where all of these incredibly wealthy families built up empires based off manufacturing, shipping and railroads uh, and lived in these mansions and filled them with these sorts of paintings. Um, so it's really interesting here to look at the, um, the uh, this sort of interior that she sits within because this was very much within the taste of the um, Gilded Age at the time of the late 19th century. Um, and what's even more interesting about this painting for me is that the painting was uh, found its way into the collection of the Met through the collection of William K, through the bequest of William K. Vanderbilt. Um, so William K. Vanderbilt was the son of, at the time, the wealthiest man in America, who happened to also inherit his wealth from his father. The Vanderbilts were a family that made a enormous, enormous um, fortune off railroads. And Vanderbilt here obviously lived in a uh, mansion on Fifth Avenue, um, which happened to be on the same street that the Met was founded on. Um, and uh, yeah, sort of within this mansion built a collection of these sort of European paintings um, that really spoke to the tastes of the upper crust of Europe from the past 200 years. Now, interestingly, um, these are the two men who were really pivotal in the founding of the Met Museum, who were also um, made the money out of, out of railroads. Uh, and so it's sort of interesting here as well to sort of think about that previous painting by Boucher. If you look here at the seat that Vanderbilt is on, there's that similar sort of detail that one finds in the Rococo style paintings of Boucher. And here, the same sort of textiles on the seats that are uh, on the chaise lounge that, that we saw in the previous rendering of Venus. Um, so I think what that painting speaks to is, is the desire at the time of this particular cabal of elites in New York to build a museum and to build a collection within that museum that allowed them to tie themselves to the high art and culture of Europe. Um, the, you know, they were this uh, newly um, sort of independent colony um, that had also just come out of this period of the Civil War, trying to develop this idea of what America was as a nation and what these elites, what these one percenters sort of really deigned themselves to do was to build a collection based off European art that will be able to tie them and America into the history of the aristocracy and the nobility of Europe. Um, I really love this painting as well, and I think it also speaks to parts of the founding mission of, um, of the Met and the way that they really tried to locate themselves within this history of, um, of, of Europe in this very particular way. Um, so um, the Met has a really high um, number of paintings from the Netherlands. Um, and that was because at the time in the late 19th century, the founders of the Met were really interested in drawing out the relationship between New York and the Dutch given that New York was a colony, originally a colony founded by the Dutch West India Trading Company during the time of colonization in the 16th century, um, sort of perpetuated by the Western European powers, including the Netherlands. So this is one painting of many in the exhibition that you'll see that are from Dutch painters that speak to that drive to link the history of New York to this European history of its uh, founding by the Dutch. Um, 
what I really find interesting about this particular painting um, is the way that it brings together both this biblical story and the um, landscape and the history of Western Europe. And it also speaks to the ways that um, the elites and the patrons of the arts would somehow use um, their patronage and art as a whole to somehow insert themselves into this particular aspirational understanding of history where they were sort of embedded and close to these really important historical currents, sort of framed in a way that uh, showed them as, as benevolent. Um, and you can really see that in this painting here. Um, so because of the scale of this painting, it's quite small. So it's only 25 by 35. Um, so uh, one assumes that it was a painting commission for personal devotion. Um, and here you see um, uh, the Virgin Mary uh, with Mary Magdalene and John um, sort of uh, with her as they take uh, Christ's body off the cross um, after his crucifixion. Obviously like Venus in the, in the first painting I showed you, this was a very common um, subject matter for paintings at the time. Um, and sort of what's interesting about this rendering is if one looks at the two people holding the um, body of Christ as he's come off the, um, the uh, crucifix here. So these two, um, two men are actually dressed in what would have been contemporary dress of the day. So if you look at the jewels here and the and the hat and the robes, um, this is to signal the contemporary, um, uh, yeah, that these are contemporary people that would have been from the time of the person who commissioned this painting, set off against this much more historical rendering of a very popular image from biblical history. Now in the background, you'll see that this is actually, these are backgrounds taken from um, Western, um, taken from Western Europe. And now obviously the crucifixion didn't happen in Western Europe, um, but it seems like this painting sort of really points to the desire at the time in the 1400s of those who had the means to commission paintings to use that art to really tell a story and render a story of themselves as being close to these stories and these histories that really define the structures of power of the societies of the day. And to frame it in a way that um, really positioned the elites as people who were benevolent, who were, um, yeah, uh, to sort of um, brush over the, the types of inequality that may have existed in the, um, in the societies of the day. Um, I really wanna talk about this painting briefly to think about um, the historical mission of, the historical and educational mission of the Met, where they use this collection as well to really try and tell a history of Europe and a history of, um, uh, yeah, a history of the uh, colonial powers to which they're connected. <clears throat> so this painting is from, um, this painting by Velasquez is a uh, beautiful portrait of Count Duke of Olivares. Um, and it's obviously a really common subject matter of uh, the nobility or aristocracy in an equestrian style portrait. Um, but what I found really interesting about this painting is that Olivares, who was a, um, one of the uh, main advisors to King Philip at the time uh, in Spain, was someone who was obviously very closely um, embedded in discussions about um, military strategy and action um, with the uh, with King Philip, but never actually ex um, was on any battlefields himself. 
And so what we have here is a commission of a painting by Velasquez, who really renders this, this person who never would have seen a battle in this equestrian portrait with this battle and soldiers just in the foreground here, as if he's ready to ride in and save the day. And I guess it's really interesting in sort of thinking about the ways that these sorts of commissions and paintings and art history and canon has been deployed by those close to political and um, economic power to really render particular narratives about themselves that are quite flattering or tells a history that perhaps glosses over a lot of the complexities of the reality of what was happening at the time. Um, the, way, the other reason why I really wanted to speak to this painting is because of Velasquez himself. And so I feel like um, Velasquez, as one of the um, main painters of the royal court at the time, was someone who was brought into this sort of bizarro world of the powerful and the elite and these institutions to work with them to create these renderings and paintings of history. Um, but uh, I really want to talk about Velasquez in relation to this portrait, which actually isn't in the exhibition itself, but is held in the um, is held in the collection of the Met. Um, so I feel like this portrait really gives us a sense of the world and the economic and social milieu that not only the subjects of these paintings, but also the painters existed in. So this portrait is an incredibly famous portrait. It's one that is a real prized jewel of the Met, of the Met's collection. And the interesting thing about it is because of the subject, um, the subject of the painting. So Wanda de Bahreja, who is the subject of this painting, um, was actually held in enslavement by the Velasquez family and workshop at the time that this um, portrait was executed and made. Um, and Velasquez went on to free Juan de, Bere de Pereja from uh, slavery in the same year after, uh, in the same year that this, that this portrait was, was painted. Um, so I think it's really interesting here to think about the, the sort of the world and the history and the milieu that many of these paintings came from not only in their execution at the time that they were made, but also in the world of the people who collected them some 100, 200 years later in an attempt to tell a story of themselves in relationship to Europe and its legacy in the new world. Um, I really wanna turn now to four paintings from a later period in the exhibition. Um, because I think it really helps us talk through some of the histories of revolution and change that are told within this exhibition, <clears throat> mainly through the work of the Impressionists. Now, obviously, this is a central cornerstone of the art history canon, that there was this group of French and European painters in the late 19th century who were bucking the trend so much, they weren't showing in the salon, they weren't um, being recognized by the official institutions, but completely revolutionized the way that we understand art today. And while that is certainly true in so many ways, I really wanna draw out the complexities and the nuances of how that story gets to be told and who is involved in ensuring that that story is what is held within the collections of our major um, art institutions. So the next four paintings I'm gonna talk about come from the collection of the Habermeyer family and from the, the, the bequest of the Habermeyer family after the death of Louis Ian Habermeyer, Habermeyer in 1928. Now the Habermeyer family, like the Vanderbilts, lived on a Gilded Age mansion on Fifth Avenue at the same time that the Met was originally founded in its original building on Fifth Avenue. Now, interestingly, and perhaps um, in a way that's a little bit more complex and concerning, uh, is that the Habermeyers didn't make all of their money off the railroads. 
they made their money off the sugar refinery business. Now, um, Louisiana Havemeyer's um, father and grandfather were the ones that accumulated all of that wealth through sugar refining. Um, but sort of thinking back to the previous painting that spoke to the sort of slavery that was embedded in some of these painterly families, the Havemeyers, while they didn't own slaves, their um, wealth was built off and relied upon the slavery that was still happening on Cuban sugar fields at the time. So here we have a family that has built their huge, enormous wealth off uh, the exploitation of the enslavement of people in the global south, um, using their labor, um, refining the sugar and making a mozza. Um, now, Louisiane Havemeyer then went on in the early 20th century to become a huge um, force in the suffragette movement. She became a huge feminist from within her mansion on Fifth Avenue um, and obviously tried to position herself as a radical in a particular way. And this is also spoken to by the collection that she held. And so obviously this beautiful portrait by Renoir, um, you can see in the background here that it really fits into the narrative of the break from the academic style painting that preceded it, attempting to sort of, you know, find new ways of connecting and expressing and sort of showing our relationship ship to the world through, through painting. Um, uh, I want to bring up this Degas painting as well, because um, Havemeyer was this huge patron of Degas and is really quite famous for it. And I want to use this painting to think about the means by which the Impressionists were able to insert themselves into art history, even though they had this narrative about being relative outsiders. Now, I'm sure as many of you know, um, may know, America was a hugely important market for the Impressionists. Now, at the time, obviously, a lot of these Impressionist painters weren't finding much success in France, but these international markets were the things that were really allowing them to continue to paint in France and to enter into these collections that would eventually uh, make their way into the collections of the cultural institutions that attempt to write a public art history. So um, Havemeyer had a really great, obviously had a really great relationship with a French art dealer who modernized and revolutionized the art market in the late 19th century through the work of the Impressionists and managed to cultivate an international market for this work. Um, Paul Duran Ruel, that, um, that uh, entrepreneur and art dealer who really championed the Impressionists is this linchpin in the story of how people like Degas were able to be supported to continue making these paintings. And it was people like Havemeyer who provided so much financial support to the Impressionists to be able to make this incredible work and now be hailed as these disruptors of this art history that preceded them. Um, so this Corbet painting was also from the collection of Havemeyer. Um, and it's really interesting to think about with this painting, the relationship between the elites and what we consider as revolutionary. Um, so this Corbet painting, what at the time was considered so cutting edge and so, um, so revolutionary in its depiction of the female body. And you can imagine um, Havamaya being really drawn to this painting, given all of her work within the suffragette movement in the early 20th century. Now this painting, The Young Bather, is well known for its rendering of an ungainly female body, one that is uh, sort of meant to be if you you know sort of think about in relationship to the way that we're trying to represent the female body outside of this idealized form at the time in the late 19th century 
Corbet was perhaps thinking about similar ideas. <clears throat> but, you know, sort of thinking about the milieu that he uh, came from, the fact that this was sort of revolutionary at the time, I think speaks to the very slow increments that are consistently made from within these um, halls, of, halls of power. Um, this final painting here that I want to talk about will sort of allow me to um, come back into some discussions now about museums and their current sort of push for advocating for justice and equality and social change. Um, I find it so interesting that Havemeyer collected this painting and has now found its way into the Met collection and is being used by the Met to tell the story of revolution and art for the people in the late 19th and early 20th century. So this painting, Third Class Carriage, is by Honoré Daumier, who was a satirist and um, an activist and a painter and a cartoonist in France for a long time who really tried to draw out the contradictions within bourgeoisie life. And so you can see here that this is one of his well-known paintings of um, the people within the third class carriage of a train. Now, public transport was a huge interest for Daumier because it was an area where people from all these different classes and all these backgrounds would come into the same area and you would see them all together. And so it's interesting here to think about why Havemeyer would be drawn to this sort of painting and why the sorts of people that would support the Met would be drawn to this sort of painting, given that it's a rendering of something so far outside of their lived experience, so far outside of how they understand and see the world. And it's a rendering of the sorts of people who live a life of impoverishment and sort of at the butt end of inequality that uh, is necessitated by the sort of opulent lives that are lived by, by those who run these sort of these institutions and museums. And I think the sort of contradictions of someone as wealthy as Havemeyer being drawn to these renderings of the working class and the poor really speaks to the contradictions that we find ourselves in today, where museums are talking about somehow wanting to engage in these issues of social inequality. Now, coming back to the 21st century and what's happening today, um, one can think about the structures of the Met, even it has moved away from Fifth Avenue and now exists sort of um, on the outskirts of Central Park, that its frameworks and its relationship to power and money and the elites still really exists and still really shapes what it is um, and how it functions. So there's a um, interesting story here from the New York Times from 2010 that was speaking about um, the relationship between donations and money and boards of trustees of various New York cultural organizations. Um, so the Met along with MoMA is uh, the board that it costs the most to get onto uh, and it holds the most cultural cachet. So it costs about $10 million to become, uh, to get onto the board of trustees at the Met and at MoMA. Um, and so that really contextualizes the, um, uh, the protests that were happening in 2020 around the relationships to inequality that museums have and to these one percenters that museums have and consistently have had. Um, and you will see here the image of the couple just down below. So that's um, Daniel Brodsky, um, who was previously the chair of the Met um, up until early 2021. He was the chair of the Met at the time that this protest happened. And Brodsky, like the sort of early donors and early patrons of the Met, comes from intergenerational wealth, comes from family, has worked from, for the family real estate development um, corporation, uh, a corporation that really has made its money off middle-class housing developments in Manhattan. 
So that is coded, um, that sort of coded language for gentrification, social displacement, um, bringing in the middle class into previously poor areas. Um, and obviously the discussion and of the relationship between development and real estate and gentrification and art and museums is one that could take an entire other presentation and other talk, especially its relationship in Australia. Um, but I guess for the moment, I just want to flag what that situation was in early 2021 at the time that these protests around the links of these institutions' relationships to power were. Um, now, I really want to draw our attention back to the Met's um, statement from last year around their commitment to change and anti-racism and, diver and diversity in 2020 at the time of Black Lives Matter. Um, now, you'll see this, this part here that says um, that where the Met really does want to acknowledge that it is within a series of governmental uh, institutions and policies and systems that have contributed to um, perpetuating racism and injustice. So they're really trying to talk about these structures much more openly. And they really want to be clear about how much they've learned and how much they've reflected on this in light of the Black Lives Matter protests and how much they have a commitment to investing into structural change. <clears throat> now, I guess to give a sense of how slow and incremental those changes will be, um, since uh, the statement has been released, um, there has been new co-chairs announced of the Board of Trustees of the Met, um, who have taken over from Daniel Brodsky. So for the first time ever, they have a woman as, they, as the co-chair of the Board of Trustees uh, in Candace K. Um, Beinecke. Now, this is also the first time that the Met has ever had co-chairs. So in the first time that they've ever appointed a woman in a leadership position, they've also made the decision to have a co-chair alongside her, who is another incredibly wealthy white man, Hamilton E. James, who's a billionaire executive of a chairman uh, and chairman, vice chairman of an investment group in New York. So obviously, um, the Met has made all of these claims about wanting to change, and uh, there has been small incremental changes, especially when we think about the shifts in the leadership positions at the museum. Um, so at the same time that a lot of these statements were being um, put out, there was an Instagram account uh, started called Change a Museum, which I would really encourage you all to go and look at. Um, it is now, it has turned into a huge, huge Instagram account that is, uh, allows uh, people who have worked from within museums to try and give air to the stories of the structural racism that they encountered in these places at a time where museums are really trying to position themselves as cultural leaders of social justice and equality. Um, now, in the interest of time, I won't go, go too in depth into this particular story that was um, uh, about the Met that can be found on the page of Change the Museum. But uh, in broad brush strokes, um, the person who posted this story really tries to draw out the contradictions between the volunteer docents or gallery guides uh, who work at the Met, who for the most part come from incredibly wealthy families and donors, and the way that they engage with um, the mostly working class and mostly non-white students who come through the Met in the education program. And the contradictions that he draws out really calls into question the capacity for these museums to shift, to change, to meaningfully contribute to these discussions of social justice and equality, given the foundations that they began with that still shape the systems of power that, um, that control the museums today. Now, obviously the Met is um, 
an ex it's a really extreme example of that inequality. Um, and its story is really interesting for thinking about museums as a whole. But these sorts of critiques and these sorts of issues aren't isolated to the Met. And I feel like if we only concentrated on the Met, then we would really sort of misconstrue just how deep and how, um, how prevalent this issue is and how deep it goes and how structural it is. And that sort of scapegoating just one institution isn't really gonna allow us to think about how we need to move forward to reform these places or change these places or think about how they can change to actually be relevant to the 21st century. Um, I wanna call your attention to this, um, I want to call your attention to this essay that was published on Medium last year um, by an artist and writer, Lily Lai, who worked in front of house at the MCA. And in this really beautifully written and powerful essay, Lily goes through some of these issues they encountered in the museum, coming into it as someone who didn't come from wealth and someone who doesn't come from a Western background. And I guess in reading this essay, and my apologies that I don't have, have the time in this presentation to go into it too deeply, the um, issues that Lily, that Lily raised resonated with so many people, including myself, because the stories that they recounted are so prevalent in the museum sector, especially when you're a person in front of house from a non-Western background, dealing with this public and this institution that sort of very publicly and on the outside is talking about how it's contributing to social change and demonstrating that through the diversity of their frontline workers, but still really facing these structural and institutional barriers at, uh, around actually making any meaningful contribution to discourses around social justice. So within this um, uh, framework of museums talking about engaging with inclusion and diversity and decolonization, we still ex exist within an art sector in Australia where the executive and leadership positions and cultural backgrounds that we see in our major institutions still reflect a period of time that's similar to the white Australia policy. So uh, fewer than one in 10 leaders at either the board level or the executive le level in uh, artistic um, institutions and museums in Australia come from a culturally and linguistically diverse background. Now, obviously that is so out of step with the actual demographics of the country that we live in. <clears throat> now this, Incredible research was done by Diversity Arts Australia in this report released called Shifting the Balance. I would really encourage people to go and seek out that report, have a closer look. But I do wanna say that this data that they collected is incredibly important, but it underplays just how dire the situation is in Australia. So through the methodology that Diversity Arts Australia employed, culturally and linguistically diverse doesn't only include people from non-European backgrounds, it also includes people from continental European backgrounds. So here that 9% of culturally linguistically diverse includes people who only come from a non-Anglo background, but may come from a background like French or Dutch or German they would also come under this uh, measurement of cultural and, linguistically di uh, cultural and linguistic diversity that Diversity Arts Australia deployed for this research. So the numbers here that we see are actually making it look like it's a little bit better than it really is. And I think the other thing we need to keep in mind uh, is that a lot of people from culturally uh, and linguistically diverse backgrounds and people from First Nations backgrounds are in leadership and board positions on multiple, um, multiple organizations, multiple museums, multiple galleries. Um, and so 
this 4% and 9% of people from a non-cal background may also include people that were counted twice. Now, that's actually really unsurprising um, to happen in Australia because in a broader context, in our political, in our economic and in our educational sectors, the same sort of data persists in the research into the um, cultural heritage of people in leadership positions. So there was a really fantastic report done in 2018 called Leading for Change, a Blueprint for Cultural Diversity and Inclusive Leadership by the Australian Human Rights Commission, where they looked at the um, cultural background of the ASX 200 CEOs, so the top 200 um, companies and corporations on the Australian Stock Exchange, the federal ministry, the heads of state and federal public service, and the university vice chancellors to try and get a snapshot of what our leadership and positions of institutional power look like in this country. And like our cultural sector, the results were very dire. So across all of these different sectors, fewer than 5% of people come from non-European or Indigenous background. And obviously, when we exist in a broader context where these institutions are really trying to push this programmatic agenda of exhibitions that include sort of these people from diverse backgrounds that try and champion social justice and equality, they're perhaps really not getting to the heart of the issue, which is the systemic injustice and, and inequality that lies at the foundation of the institutions that build up our society. Now that's actually a really dire sort of um, understanding of museums, of society, of our capacity to change, of our capacity to overcome inequalities. And that's not an incorrect assumption. These places are dire in a lot of ways and do really reflect a deep, deep, deep conservatism that I think many of us would agree that we're all trying to move away from. But then there's this sort of contradictory and thorny question that I consistently return back to and others I know consistently return back to of why do we keep on working with museums even though we know that they're hostile places, even though we know that they're kind of cooks and gross. Um, and I think that this work by Christian Thompson from 2003 really speaks to some of those contradictions and the way we might position ourselves in relationship to these museums. So uh, this series, Emotional Striptease from 2003, I love this series. It's such an interesting body of work because it gives us a sense in Australia of just how long these discussions about the issues with museums have been going on. So this series from some 18 years ago, um, Dr. Christian Thompson Ayer brought together all of these artists and arts workers uh, from a First Nations background into this series where they were placed in front of backdrops of these cultural institutions, sort of recreating um, the um, fashion and the aesthetics of late 19th century photography to sort of think about the the, um, the legacies and the, um, the ways that this colonial framework continues to inform the way that they work today. Um, the thing that I really love about this work is the sort of history and the story of the people involved in this image that continued on after this series was made. So the person in this image is Genevieve Greaves, an incredibly amazing Warimi woman um, who uh, is shown here in front of the Melbourne Museum in 2003, um, who then went on after this image was taken to work for the Melbourne Museum. <clears throat> and it was through her incredible work that she contributed to bringing together the first people's exhibition in the Bundjalaka part of the museum, which, uh, she contributed to advocating for being run by first peoples. 
um, against the bureaucracy of the museum, against these structural issues that exist within these broader cultural institutions that tell our histories, that hold our cultural memories and attempt to reflect back to us who, who we are. Now, obviously, I feel like Christian Thompson and Genevieve Greaves from these works aren't unaware of the issues that plague these institutions, yet they still make the decision to continue to work within these spaces to try and contribute to social change. And I think that's because we do need to recognize that these institutions hold so much power, so much cultural power. And it's because of that, that people make the decision to work within them to contribute to cultural change, to contribute to shifts in our cultural landscape. But in this sort of um, current environment where institutions are trying to place themselves as these cultural leaders of social justice and change, I think we need to be really clear where the engine for social transformation is actually coming from. And I want to contend here that it's absolutely not coming from museums. It's absolutely not coming from these major institutions that now, after decades and decades of people fighting for justice, fighting for them to really look at their history and their relationships to power, these are not the places that are guiding the change. It is actually the people on the ground. It's the artists, it's the activists, it's the communities that are consistently being represented in these spaces that are driving that social change. And it's only now that museums are starting to catch up. So when we think about culture and art and art history as a whole, we not only need to consider what's in the halls of these museums, but also the consistent work that is being done by people who can see these museums for the strange and contradictory and cooked places that they are, yet still continue to champion and do work and try and contribute to social change outside of them.